this morning. I am so thankful that my God is in the battle. There are a lot of battles being waged today, a lot of battles being fought in many different ways, and our God can be right in the midst of those battles. This morning, if you have your Bibles with you, please, I encourage you to open them up to Luke chapter 3 today. We're in Luke chapter 3. I'm absolutely convinced we cannot be a follower of Christ if we don't know what God's Word says. We cannot be a follower of Christ if we do not do what God's Word says. And so we're going to continue to press into the Word of God this year. We're going to continue to lean in and try to allow it to do the changing within our lives. And today we come to Luke Chapter 3. I know many people have hopes for 2022. I know I have hopes. I have dreams. And I am absolutely convinced and believe God is going to do something great in 2022. All right. I have this side of the room that's with me. So I'm going to try this side of the room. I believe that God's got something great ready and in store for 2022. All right. Thank you, Larry. I know I got you this morning. All right. But how do we prepare for it? What do we need to do? What is the basic thing that we need to keep in mind when it comes to being ready for God to do something great? Well, let's go back to the foundation today. Let's go back to the very thing. I'm, I am not here to tickle your ears and to make you feel good. I just want to make that clear right up front. I am not going to stand up here and preach in a way that you're going to walk away with kumbaya feelings sometimes and because I am going to bring the only thing that I believe is going to change your life and that's the Word of God and that's how we're going to prepare for 2022 is through the Word. So how do we prepare? How do we get ready for God to move in our life? Well, the very first thing we need to do is study soteriology. Oh, it got quiet in here when I use that word. That, that right there is a $10 word. I'm using a $10 word this morning. Soteriology. Why don't you say it with me? Soteriology. Soteriology. Come on, let's try it one more time. Soteriology. What in the world is soteriology? <laughs> Would you like to know? If we're going to talk about it, you need to know what soteriology is, right? Soteriology is the study, it is the idea, it is the theology of salvation. What is salvation? Where, how do we get it? Where does it come from? Anything that has to do with salvation is this idea of soteriology. So that's where we're going to be today. We're going to really get down to the basics of how do we get prepared for God to do something in our life? Through soteriology, through salvation. But let me tell you something. You may be saved today, but this message is for you. You may be wondering whether or not you're saved today. This message is definitely for you. You may know that you're not saved, and if you died right now, you would not go to heaven. This message is for you today. If you just hope that you've been good enough to get to heaven, this message is for you today. It's not for those who, who are, are uh, unaware, who really don't care about heaven in their life and God in a relationship. This message is for you who want to know today how to prepare for God to do something in your life. So, as we get into this, we're going to be talking about a man by the name of John the Baptist. Pop quiz. Is John the Baptist older or younger than Jesus? He's older. How much older is he approximately? Six months. Very good. We got some people who's in the Word here. If you did not know that, that's okay. Now you do. So if I do a pop quiz about this again, you're going to know. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. They are related. John the Baptist is a cousin of this man, Jesus Christ. They probably grew up together. They talked together. They played together. They had their toddler to uh, toys together probably. They probably played in the dirt together. Jesus and John the Baptist grew up together as family. Now here's an interesting thing. Many of you have never thought of Jesus being a toddler. Jesus was a toddler. 
if he was a baby in Luke chapter 2, he was 12 years old at the end of Luke chapter 2, then surely Jesus was a toddler between those two points. Jesus grew up with John the Baptist, and now we come to a place where this man named Luke introduces us to this man named John who was born in Luke chapter 1 with his mom and dad. We hear the story. Luke is the only one who actually tells us about the birth of John the Baptist. No other gospel, no other, other writings tell us about John Baptist being born except for Luke, and that's found in chapter 1. But here we find John the Baptist is preaching. He is doing a ministry. And I want us to read this, and then I want to talk about something very interesting about where he's at doing ministry. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Aturia and Tacnotus, not I saw. Excuse me, folks. My tongue gets tied up. And Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene. Now, when you read verse 1, you get very confused. and You go, what is Luke telling us here? Luke is not only giving us a date of when John started doing this, but he's giving us a background of what's going on uh, in the culture. When you study these people, you will find out it was a very difficult time. Verse 2. In the high priesthood of an Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to him into all the district. Well, hold on. The word of an Anna, blah, blah. My phone is making noise. Excuse me. Don't have any idea why that just happened. That is the weirdest thing. Maybe it's because maybe the devil's working on my phone this morning. But I turned the volume down. So let's go back to verse 2. Verse 2, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district, district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crook will become straight and the rough road smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Father, this morning, it seems like every week this year, something is going on in this place to try to distract us from what you want to do in the hearts and minds of people, so that people will be distracted and not hear from you. God, I pray right now, you encamp angels all around this place, that you remove any, any influence of the evil one in this room. Lord, if somebody is on their phone and they're not paying attention, break their phone right now so it will not even come back on. Lord, if somebody right now is, is doodling on a piece of paper, break the lead on, on the paper or let the pen run out of ink. Let them focus on you that you may change their life. Remove all distractions so they may hear your word today. Do not let the enemy have foothold in this place. God, we pray, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have your phone out and you're not paying attention to the, to the sermon, I just prayed that it will get broken. And I believe God will answer that prayer. So if you think playing a game is going to be okay, you better turn it off. <laughs> now, why did I pray that? Why is that important? Because the enemy does not want you to hear today's message. He wants you to think, oh, I'm okay. There's no need for me to pay attention. This isn't important today. But listen to me. John the Baptist began his ministry not in Jerusalem, where all the religious elite was at. He did not begin it in the church where it was comfortable. He began it and continued to do it in the wilderness and in the desert. He ate locusts and honey, locusts being like a Grasshopper. Anybody here ever just saw a grasshopper in your yard and went, man, that thing's big and ju jump, uh, plump and juicy. I think I'm going to have that for lunch. Anybody here ever eaten a grasshopper? Uh, look, there's a couple of people in here that have had grasshoppers before. Some places you can get chocolate grasshoppers. I don't understand that. That is beyond my comfort. I would rather have chocolate wrapped around peanut butter myself than a grasshopper. But John the Baptist is eating locusts and honey, wild honey. He is dressed in camel hair, and he's doing his ministry in the wilderness. 
Why was he doing ministry in wilderness and not in the religious center of the entire nation? I believe it's mainly because that is where we need to be ministered to most and, and, and foremost. Because the people on the outskirts who's in the wilderness don't feel like they fit in. That There's nothing here for them. John the Baptist is in the wilderness preaching a, a message to get people ready for Jesus Christ. See, no matter what I say today, I am not going to be the one to change your life. I'm only preaching a message to get you ready for Jesus Christ in your life. John used what he had that God had put him in front of him to do the best he could with what he had. H.G. Wells said this, and I love this quote, and other people have said it in different ways. H.G. Wells said, what really matters is what you do with what you have. Our problem is, is we want God to do things with things we don't have, but yet we don't have them yet. And we're going to wait till He gives them to us before we do anything. So the things that we have, we don't do nothing with. That was a mouthful. Let me put it this way. Until you do with what God's given you to do with, then He's not going to give you anything else. You need to take what God's given you and use it for His glory and not your own. You need to take what God has put before you and use that the best you can and continue to move forward and He will bring you some more. John the Baptist was in the wilderness, in the desert with locust and honey and camel hair. It did not hold him back from doing something for God. That was his ministry. That was his mission. That was his calling. I am telling you today... Do with what you have been given for Him, and He will do greater things through you because you're faithful in that. John was trained in the desert. Understand that his training came while he was in the desert. Some people in here may be in a desert or a wilderness. you got more questions than you got answers. Let me tell you, that's where God's going to do a lot of his work is in those places. God will shout more clearer in your life when you're going through the, the, the junk of life than when everything is going well because you're going to be so busy, you're going to be so distracted by things in this life when everything is good that you won't be hearing what he's having to say. So a lot of times God is much clearer. He does more training in the desert and the wilderness than we ever imagined. God had John start his ministry right in the middle of nowhere, not in the center hub of, of what people would say is the place to go and find faith, the place to draw close to God. He's in the wilderness baptizing people in a dirty, filthy river. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to say that when I was baptized, it was not in a baptismal pool in a church with a warm heater. I got baptized in, in a river. And let me tell you something, it was cold. I was glad to get baptized. And I'm going to be real with you. I waited three years to get baptized because I knew how cold that water was. <laughs> but I finally, uh, I finally said, yes, I will get into that water and be baptized. Here is John the Baptist baptizing people in a river. Now this river is not clean. It is not known for being clean. It is a dirty, filthy river. Way it, it falls down very quickly. There are animals who are leaving their remnants behind upstream. There are all kinds of things getting into this river and it is getting nastier and nastier as it gets down. But this river is a place where it is cleansing the soul and the mind and God took him to this place. Now here's uh, one thing that Warren Wiersbe said about John the Baptist and God and his ministry. Warren Wiersbe said, God bypassed great and mighty rulers and gave his word to a Jewish prophet in the wilderness. God may be giving you a word today or this week or this month that he's trying to get to you and you keep thinking, well, I just can't do it. I'm just not good enough. I just don't know enough. I make too many mistakes. Let me tell you, God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for availability in your life to do something. If he was looking for perfect, I sure would not be up here. I am far from perfect. But I can tell you this. Whenever we put ourselves in a place for God to use us, he will do a great and mighty thing. And that's what God is doing with John. So let's look at John's message for a moment. It says in verse 3 that he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, which Buddy read today, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Let me tell you today, here's the message. Make ready the way of the Lord in your life and in the lives of those around you. So I want us to really dive into this idea of soteriology because this is what John is talking about, salvation. When I was growing up, 
I am, I'm going to be transparent. I was growing up, I accepted Jesus Christ when I was really young. I was about six or seven years old. I was baptized several years later. I, I was in the church. I announced my calling to preach when I was 14. And I was actually on staff at a church and could not give you a clear understanding or explanation of salvation. Why is that? Why is it that I could know that I was going to heaven, but I didn't fully understand salvation? Let me tell you why it is. Discipleship. It's because I, was not, I had not been discipled. No pastor had ever explained it so that I could grab hold of it. No one had ever sat down and said, here's the elements of salvation. And you know what I had to do? I had to look for it myself in Scripture. I went to seminary to learn more about it. And now I am here to present to you today this clear understanding of what salvation is and what makes up salvation. Let me begin with this. Everyone in this room, everyone listening and watching this particular sermon, you are in need of God's salvation. And it comes only through Jesus Christ. No other way, no other faith. It's not through the Baptist or the Methodist. It's not through conservative or liberal. It is not through Mormonism. It is not through Allah. It is only through Jesus Christ you will find salvation for your souls. Uh, that, is, that is the absolute right up front. Now let's dive into this message that John is preaching. He is putting out there for people to really get a hold of so that they, they can understand what it is, how to get ready for Jesus Christ. No, verse number 3. And he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. Somebody say repentance. Somebody look at the person next to you and say repent. I know some of you were, have been waiting all day hoping somebody would tell you to tell your, the person next to you to repent. So why don't we flip it around? Now you look at the other person and you go, repent. Now let's talk about repentance because repentance is key here. John is preaching a message before Jesus dies on the cross, before Jesus begins his ministry really. John the Baptist is saying, repent. This is a message you will read in the Old Testament. This idea of salvation isn't new to the New Testament. It is something continued from the Old Testament. This idea of being saved from something. This idea of being rescued and delivered. But here is John the Baptist getting everything ready for Jesus to bring about the salvation you and I know of today. And he begins with this. Get ready for Jesus. Repent. So let's talk about repentance. It literally means a change of mind, but it refers to more of a broadly human dimension involved in the experience of a conversion, of that idea of, of turning 180 degrees, not 360, because if you turn 360 degrees, you know where you wind up? The exact same place. A lot of people think repentance is just that. If I'll just turn, I'll be okay. But this is not repentance. Repentance is turning and going in the other direction. When you're living your life in one direction and you're sinning and you know that you're doing wrong and God has convicted you of that and things are going on in your life and you know, I should not do that. But here's how we love to really deal with sin in our life. Let's be real. Watch this. I'm going this way. There is a sin in front of me. We like to say, I'm going to repent, Lord. I'm going to repent. I'm going to repent. I'm repenting, and before long, we're right back to where we were. Is that not true for our life? Repentance is being serious and saying, I'm not going in that direction anymore, no matter what it takes. I'm going in this direction. I'm going in the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. It is turning from. It is a turning away from. It is going in another direction. That is repentance. So John the Baptist is giving a message. He's saying, repent. He's saying, turn. He's saying, change your ways, change your mind, change so that you can see that you're not going to accomplish righteousness, continuing to do the same things you've always done. You only accomplish righteousness and you find holiness whenever you turn from those things and go in the other direction. Somebody needs to hear this. You cannot play around with sin. You cannot flirt with sin. If there's something in your life and you need to change it, stop flirting with it. Stop letting a little bit of it stick around because you know what's going to happen? It's going to jump right back all over you. If you want to get rid of sin, repent. That means get rid of it completely. 
If it's words you say, if, if you are using language you should not, and God's convicted you of that, don't just make your language better. Fix it and stop using it all. Don't even use the substitutes. Get whatever God has convicted you of. I want you to repent. That's how you prepare for God to do something in your life great. Because if you don't deal with sin, you know what God's going to have to do? He's going to have to make you deal with it. So John the Baptist is really saying here, repent. Now how is this repentance tied to baptism? Because Jesus is actually baptized later in this chapter. So uh, some people may look at it and say, well, Jesus was baptized. Does that mean he had sin and he had to repent to be baptized? Here's what baptism is. The reason they would get baptized is not because of some supernatural thing that would happen in their life and make them pure. It was an outward expression of an inward reality. When someone would repent and turn in the other direction, they would be baptized to declare, I am accepting the message, I am repenting today, I am asking God to forgive me, and I am going to live a different life. That's what they would do when they would get baptized. So it was an outward expression of an inward condition. Jesus walks up. Jesus doesn't have to repent. He doesn't have to ask for forgiveness, but when he is baptized, it is an outward expression of an inward reality in his life. He's already pure. And then it gave us a clear example that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we want to follow him, let's do what he does, let's get baptized. After that, so that it's a reflection of what's on the inside of our life. Now, when we look at John the Baptist's message a little bit more, and many of you may have more questions about that, and we'll talk about it later. John the Baptist says, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The second thing, not only is re repentance a key, but forgiveness is critical. See, we often like to talk about forgiveness. I was watching the news the other day, and a news reporter asked a man if he would ever forgive the person who did what they did in the life of the person that was, was killed. They asked him and said, Will you ever forgive this person for killing your child? And he said, without hesitation, no, I will not forgive. I will never forgive. Let me tell you, my heart broke because that man just locked the door on a cell of misery for the rest of his life. His unforgiveness will not punish the one who did wrong. God offers us forgiveness God offers to us something that we cannot do for ourselves and a freedom that we can let go of. A freedom that will get us out of a cell so that we can live a life and have it more abundantly. And forgiveness is key. See, we walk around in shame and guilt, but God wants us to walk around with hope and freedom. And that is offered only through Jesus Christ. We can forgive ourselves and we can forgive other people. But let me tell you, when it comes to sin, sin is between us and God. Even if we sin against someone else, it is between us and God. And that has to be fixed as well. So John the Baptist is saying, there is a repentance where you turn and you go the other way. And there is a forgiveness that is offered. And this is before the cross, it is before the resurrection. So ladies and gentlemen, salvation included repentance and forgiveness before the cross. So what in the world? How does this fit in? See, the forgiveness of sin is present. It is a realization that we can be set free. But when we look at it in the context of this, we have to understand there is a great danger the enemy wants you to buy into. He wants you to buy into, you can do this yourself. Because this has been a message that had been preached by, by prophets throughout all the Old Testament. This had been a message they had heard before. It was not a new message. Repent for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. Have no other idols. Repent, O Israel, and turn from your wicked ways. Find forgiveness for your sins. So if it was simply an idea of repenting and forgiveness, then why was Jesus even ever a part of the equation? Because it's not simply about repentance and forgiveness. Because I am here to declare to you today, 
a truth that, that I was kind of taught a little bit growing up, but something I did not realize that I even fell into the idea that if I could just get you to listen to me, repeat a prayer after me, and if you ask God to forgive you, take over your life, that if you ask God to come into your heart, however I want to phrase it, that you'd be okay and go to heaven. Let me tell you, there are millions of people that will die and go to hell who have said a sinner's prayer. A sinner's prayer will not save you. A pastor or preacher will not save you. Repeating after someone will not save you. People have repented throughout history and they are in hell. Here's the difference. Salvation is a supernatural event. It is something you cannot accomplish. It is something that only God can do in your life. Salvation comes from God, is offered through God, so that we may be in connection with God. That's why Jesus had to come. Because we are insignificant in being able to connect ourselves to a holy and living God. That's why salvation is a supernatural event. That's why I am here to tell you. My story is kind of strange about when, when I was born again, when I got saved, when I accepted Christ as my Savior. I didn't even fully understand what happened to me. But I can tell you this. I knew something had happened. And I talked to my mom, and she explained it to me the next day. I can tell you this. I know for a fact that it wasn't because I made a decision it wasn't because I said a prayer or repeated something after somebody. It's because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I know that God Almighty did a work inside of me that I could never do myself. That is salvation. If you're listening today and maybe you repeated the prayer for, from somebody or maybe, maybe you, you signed a card or you walked up front or something like that happened, let me tell you something. Unless God has come into your life and changed your life, you are lost and you're giving your hope on something that will fade away. Salvation is a supernatural thing that God accomplishes. That's why Jesus, the divine, came to earth. So that it could take place within our lives and the Holy Spirit could live within us. So today, the three things about soteriology that I am absolutely convinced I will die on a hill for this. There has to be repentance. There has to be forgiveness. There has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you do not have that, you are lost and on your way to hell. Notice none of it includes church attendance, Bible reading, singing in the choir, singing in the praise team, playing music at church, handing out food to over 290 families, 12,000 pounds of food we handed out Wednesday. But if you have not asked God to forgive you, take over your life uh, to allow Him to bring forgiveness in your life, and God's not the one who's done it, then you're lost. There's three things that has to do with salvation. Do not miss. The third one is the most important, and that is the work of God. For salvation is a work of God, not a work of ourselves. All this time, this whole idea of people trying to live up to the law, nobody could do it, nobody was perfect, and Jesus came. He said, let me, let me take this, let me handle this. He didn't just live a perfect life, he died. To take your place and my place. Because we have made the mistakes. And when we ask God to forgive us, ask Him to take over our life, and we truly repent, then God does a work in us and through us. That's why just a few weeks ago we saw a, a lady come up front here. She was knelt down. She was crying the whole time she came up front. She was right here. It was obvious there was a move happening in her life. She could not stop smiling. Because of what took place. That's because it wasn't simply that she repeated a prayer after me or said a few words that's going to give her a false sense of hope, but that God Himself did a work in her life. And that's what we want to see happen in your life. You want to prepare for God to do something in your life? You get this right. Because if you don't have this right, you know what God's going to be doing in 2022? Trying to get you to get this right. He can't do anything else if you don't get this right in your life. 
So when you've got this salvation thing, and you know for a fact, you know that you know that you know, I know, I know that I know that I know that I am born again, and God has changed me from the inside out. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I play bass. It's not because I've been in church all my life. It's because I know that Jesus Christ has changed me from the inside because he loves me. I know that he's real, and I know he can do it for you because he's done it for me. Salvation is a supernatural thing. How else can it say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, to the drug addict, to the sex addict, to the murderer, to the one who, who is abusive with his language, to the one who treats other people like trash and has to puff himself out? How else could it say these words in 2 Corinthians 5, 7? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. and The old is gone. How does that take place unless it's a work of an almighty God? Not a decision that we simply make. Not a prayer that we just simply repeat. But a holy God moving in our heart and our mind to change us from the inside out. One of Luke's strongest themes in this entire book and in the book of Acts is the idea of salvation. If you hold on to this, as we go through the book of Luke, you're going to see where Luke plays this theme out in multiple places. Salvation, salvation, salvation. Because that is the gospel. The gospel is for our salvation. Did you know that the term Savior is found in Luke and Acts, but only found one other time in all four gospels? The word Savior. Did you know that salvation is found ten times in the, Luke, in, book, in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts, but only one time in the other Gospels? The verb to save is found 17 times in the book of Luke, more than any other Gospel. 13 times in the book of Acts. This salvation is not primarily concerned with what people think of you or a political position or a religious uh, uh, piety. This salvation has to do with an individual's relationship with God Almighty. Could it be you can't hear from God because you don't have a relationship with Him? Could it be that He's silent because you're not asking the right questions? Maybe He's been asking you, waiting for you, to ask the right question. God, change my life. You take over. You be in control. Forgive me. I repent of my sins. And I'm going in the, your direction rather than mine. Understand, repentance is like lordship. It's saying, God, you're right. I'm not. It's saying, God, I'm going your way, not my way. Salvation is important and we need to understand it. See, Christ came to set you free from sin. Christ came to give you life so that you can have it more abundantly here on earth before you even get to heaven. Christ came and He conquered death, He conquered hell, and He conquered the grave. He destroyed the works of the devil according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. But the devil wants to convince you, you're all right. You're okay. You said the prayer. You signed the card. If there is no evidence of a change in your life, would you please get a checkup today? We cannot receive salvation and not be different. A good friend of mine, we are looking at 1 John, and in 1 John chapter 3, it says, No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this... The children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. The key factor here is, what has God done in your life to change you and to make you more like Christ? If that's not happening, you need to get a checkup. Because God is the main part of salvation. The repentance and the forgiveness is the pathway, but it is God that does the difference making. So here's the good news that John gave us today. Salvation is available for everyone. Do you understand that John was not doing his ministry where the religious elite was at? He wasn't doing the ministry around the guys going, Now, if you address more like me, 
If you'd talk more like me, if you knew the Bible more like me, then God would accept you into his kingdom and you would go to heaven if you just was more like me. John the Baptist said, it's for everyone. The ones who found themselves feeling like they had it all together were the ones that he looked at and he, he called a brood of vipers and he, he called hypocrites. They are the ones that had pride in their heart and it was filled with sin. They needed to repent. Look at what John, the, the reference Luke gives us about John here. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Let me explain to you what that means real quick. Make his path straight. That idea of making ready and making his path straight is this, simply this. Make it simple. Don't make it complicated. We've complicated this whole idea of coming to Christ, this whole idea of, of, of Jesus. We've made it so complicated that people feel too guilty to walk through the doors. We've made it so complicated, a lot of people feel like, oh, that's just an old, archaic, unnecessary thing. Look at how it's not changing their lives, so why should I even want that? They, we've made it so complicated. But this says, make his path straight. Simplify it. Get ready. Make it easier. Let's continue to read. Verse 5. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain hill will be brought low. I want you to get an image of this for a second. Every ravine, every valley will be filled. And every mountain will be brought low. What does that do? Do you, do you see it? Do you see what happens? The valley is brought up and the mountain is brought down. So that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. It isn't about where you came from. It isn't about the status you have. It doesn't matter if you're on the mountain or in the valley. It doesn't matter if you run to the mountain for security because that was often their thing. They'd go to the mountains to be safe when the enemy would attack. It doesn't matter if you feel safe when you're over here or over there. When it comes to this idea of the gospel, all that has to come down. And at the cross, everything is level. Everyone is equal. It doesn't matter where you come from. And it does not matter what you think the solution is. It's all the same. Every mountain is brought low. Everyone that is prideful and, and lifted up will be brought low. Everyone who thinks that they're nothing will be brought up so that it's level ground at the cross. The path, in verse 5, the crook will become straight and the rough road smooth. The path not only becomes level ground, but it also, it also is not complicated. See, there's a lot of people, even during this time, that would say, well, you got to do this and you got to do that. you you gotta, you, you got to fast. you got to pray. you got to do sac sacrifices. You, you've got to follow these laws. You cannot walk too far on, on the Sabbath. You, you, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. But let me tell you, let me tell you how easy it is. It's not about what you cannot do. It's about what God did so you can. And that's simply repent, ask Him to take over your life, ask Him to forgive you, and let Him do a work inside of you you. That's how simple it is. There is no bumps in the road. There is no crooked paths you have to follow. There isn't any confusion. It boils down to Jesus and the simplicity of the gospel that we are lost and He is the one who brings salvation. And I love how he winds this up right here. Isaiah writes these words and only Luke includes all of these, these words as part of Isaiah 40. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain hill will be brought low. The crook will become straight and the rough roads smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. How many? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Surely not the shepherds because we can't even trust what the shepherds say. Surely they wouldn't be included. They're a bunch of crooks. Every time they open their mouth, they're lying. Sound like some people... But you know, <laughs> but what did the angels say to them? Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
Luke includes that in chapter 2 so we understand that this good news is for all the people. In verse 32 of chapter 2, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. This was expanding beyond the Jews to make it very clear that even the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles, that was the two groups, it was for all of them. You can read the song that John the Baptist's father sang in chapter 1, and you will find the same thing, that this is for all the people, not just the Jews, but for everyone. So I'm here to tell you today, the path is straight. It is simple and not complicated, and that the ground is level at the cross. Your friends don't have to come up to where you are to find Christ, and people don't have to come down to where we are to find Christ. The level ground is right at the foot of the cross. And we need to encourage people to let them know that, ooh, if it wasn't for Jesus, what a mess we'd all be in. Here's something I want you to visually understand. I got a great gift for Christmas. Let me grab it real quick. For Christmas, I had somebody give me something I've never had before in my life. Coffee that's just coffee beans. Have you ever had coffee that's just coffee? I'm, I mean, this is, this is how coffee starts. It starts as a bean. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that smells so good. These are coffee beans, and there's potential within these beans, and this is such a great gift. This is something that is absolutely phenomenal to me, and this is some of the best coffee I've ever had. Never had coffee beans in my house. My friend who gives me this coffee, that's still coffee beans, because he, he is definitely a connoisseur of coffee. In fact, he, he has even said he is a snob of coffee. He's a coffee snob. He's made his wife a coffee snob. His, both of his boys have become coffee snobs. And ladies and gentlemen, I may become a coffee snob myself. Because he's had, he has introduced me to some what really good coffee is. We're not talking McDonald quality stuff here. Man, when you got the coffee bean... And you grind that thing fresh, and you make coffee. Oh, it is so good. Mm -mm -mm. That smells so good right now. Let me tell you something. How useful is that right now? Could I make coffee with that? Probably wouldn't be very good coffee. It would be very watered down. What do I need to do? I have to grind that coffee. It has to become something on the inside of this so that it can bless and really be a blessing in my palate when I drink it. But it's missing something. Look, I'm still coffee beans. Still coffee beans. Man, hold on. There's a blade down in here. Let me turn it. Still coffee beans. Oh, God, this is just not working. What do, what do I need to do to make this thing grind these coffee beans so I can enjoy what has been given to me? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's that thing? Power. Hmm. I want you to know I have done nothing to get electricity in this room today. Last week we lost electricity completely. Thought earlier in the service we had done it again. But I have done nothing to get electricity into this room. I don't think any of you have either. But it exists in this room without any effort from you. The power to change what's on the inside of this exists within this room. So, I need to find some power. That power can be found. Oh, oh I'm getting old. That was a long way down. Look at this. This is a drop cord. This drop cord is run from a plug. This is called what? An extension. This extension cord is going to give me the potential to do something about what's on the inside of this that's been given to me that's going to bring me great joy. Without this extension cord, without the power, all I'd have is coffee beans. It would be limited in what I could actually get and enjoy. 
But let's see what happens when I take the power that's over there and have this extension that will extend that power over to here so that we can get this power on the inside of this coffee grinder. Let's see what happens. Wait a minute. Now there's something going on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ooh, let me tell you something now. Hey, hold, hold on. Don't push the button to take the lid off at the same time. That's not a good idea. Because you spill some of that goodness. Ooh, if only you could smell what I smell. Even if you don't like coffee, you probably enjoy the smell. Oh, that coffee now can be enjoyed. But it was only whenever power was applied to the inside that the what was designed to be coming out of this was available. Let me tell you, we try and we try to do everything we can to be right with God. We try to be good. We try to do things that, that will, will, will win us favor with God. It is only through Jesus Christ you don't have to do things to, to win His favor because Jesus did all the work for you. See, the power was in heaven to change your life. Jesus left heaven to come to earth to, to bring down an extension cord, if you will. Listen to me. We have an extension cord to the power that will change you. And that extension cord is the Holy Spirit that will come and live inside of you. See, there is a transfer of power from way over there to inside here. So what happens inside here will change what's inside. That's what God wants to do in your life. And oh, the aroma Oh, the aroma, whenever you open it up and you smell, whoo, boy, that smells good. When God looks and sees you, when the Holy Spirit is inside of you and the power is residing in you, He goes, mm, look at there, they smell good. Even if they've been outside and they've been sweating, you know what God says? Mm, they smell good because the Holy Spirit's inside of them. God knows that the only way for you to be transformed is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus left heaven and came to earth so that we could have the Holy Spirit inside of us to change us. So if there's nothing else you hear today, make sure you hear me say this. Repeating a prayer and signing a card Coming to church and doing things will not save you. It is through the repentance, lordship of Christ. It is through forgiveness of your sins. And it's through the work of a holy God that you are saved. Those three, those three elements. If the Holy Spirit has done no work in your life, then according to 1 John, you're lost. How can you know if you have had God change your life? Well... One thing is for sure, you showed up today and you're listening to this message. There's something within you that's burning, that is giving you a hunger. You're wanting to grow, you're wanting to change. That's an evidence of God changing your life. What about your words? What about what other people are saying? Are you different? Are you more like Jesus? Or are you just like the world? Sometimes you may hear the words, you the man, you the man. You know what I like to say? I'm just a man trying to be like the man. The Apostle Paul said, You do as I do. Is that audacity and pride? Or is that a man who understands that if you will do what I do, you're going to be doing exactly what Jesus does? How many of us are brave enough to say that? If Jesus has changed your life, then you're born again. What must we do? Number one, I think we need to praise Him for our salvation. We need to praise Him for changing our life. I love it whenever uh, we hear, whenever we, uh, back at Thanksgiving, we offered this moment where people could holler out Thanksgiving. And right back here to the left, I believe it was Jack Bosworth who said, Praise God for changing my life, for saving my soul. We need to praise God for changing us. When's the last time we just simply said that? God, thank you. Thank you for saving me. If you're not saved today, here's how simple it is. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. See, it's not complicated. 
You don't have to go get a suit. You don't have to put on a tie. You don't have to dress up and look really nice. All you have to do is come to God. Understand that you're lost and that you have made mistakes and ask God to forgive you, take over your life, and let the Holy Spirit do something on the inside. And you can thank Him and praise Him for your salvation. Philippians 1.6 says, For I am confident of this very thing, that He who began a work in you will perfect it. Who begins the work inside of you? You? No. He being God Himself does the work inside of you. Not only do we praise Him for our salvation, but we live to please Him. There's your evidence of a changed life. There's your evidence that God has moved inside. You talk different, think different, act different. You're, you are desiring to find the ways that God would have you live. And that's what you are doing. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says, So then, my beloved, just if you, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. By the way, that's called the police syndrome, state patrol syndrome. Whenever you see a police officer on the side of the road pointed in the direction that you're, uh, direction that you're driving toward, what do you do? Woo! You take your foot off, off the pedal, hit the brakes. You're going to slow down. In, in my presence, you do what you're supposed to do. But I am confident that you're doing even what you're supposed to do, even when I'm not around you. Why is that? Because they knew Christ. He says these words in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Let me tell you something. Fear is a liar, but fear is also a good thing. Because we need to work out our salvation in fear and in trembling of a holy God who will not leave you where you are. You want God to do something in your life this year? Embrace your salvation, make sure of your salvation, and then let Him lead you down the path. Follow His way and His will. It begins with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Not three points and a poem about how if you'll just straighten out your mind, straighten out your house, if you'll start doing your dishes every day, if you start making up your bed every morning, that's not where it begins, ladies and gentlemen. If you want God to work in your life, begin with your relationship with Him and make sure, make sure, make sure it's real, He's changed you, and then God can do something in your life. If you're certain that He has... He's got something great for you, but maybe you need to make sure that you're praising Him for your salvation, looking to Him for what He's done for you. We don't do to gain access to God. We do because He's gained access to us through Jesus Christ. We do great things and we do good things because grace has been extended to us. And we want to do the right things to praise Him for the change He's made in our life. Our way is not working, but God's way will always work. And it's this simple. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone can change your life. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you for the lives that you have already changed and the lives that you will change. Lord, through the ministries of this church, I know of at least 20 people who, was, who were saved in 2021 because of this place, because of the people in this place, because of the ministries of this place. 20 people were saved. But Father, we are not satisfied with that. We want to see more people come to faith in you, to understand you as their Lord and Savior. So God, we're going to begin this year to make sure that we're okay because we can't go and tell them the good news if we ourselves don't understand it. We can't tell them about Christ if we ourselves are not sure we're connected with Him. So right now, this day, this morning, let it become sure. Let it become real. Let us know for a fact that God, we're connected to You, that You have forgiven us, your grace has been extended to us and that the Holy Spirit lives within us. This is not about a show, Lord. This is not about checking off a list. I feel better today because I've been in church. 
This is about a life change that lasts for an eternity. Lord, today I have no idea who this message is for. So God, you use it to minister. You use it to help the one who has been struggling with the idea and the question, am I saved? I hope I'm saved. Lord, let today be the day that they no longer have to say that. Lord, may you deal with their heart right now. May they feel you. May they know you. May they absolutely be convinced that you are drawing them. And may right now, may they just simply repent, ask you to take over their life, ask for forgiveness. And Lord, ask you to come in and just radically change them. Lord, the devil wants to keep people in a state of insecurity. Because then he has them in a, a cell of control that they just need to perform better. Do more. Do more Bible study. Go to church more. But God, you have declared. And I thank you that every mountain will be made low and every ravine will be filled, every crooked way made straight, and every bump in the road will made, be made smooth. It is simple. It's not complicated. But, Lord, the enemy wants to make it that way. Everyone here is good enough to be saved. And everyone who thinks they're good is bad enough that they need to be saved. Lord, today... Do the work that only you can. Lord, until we're sure of our salvation and sure of our relationship with you and we walk in that, you cannot do a great work in our life. Lord, right now, someone may be here and you're dealing with them and they just need to ask you, God, I've messed up. I've not been sure whether I belong to you or not. I don't know if I've been saved. But right now, they need to just simply acknowledge that you want them to talk to you. But right now, they just need to ask you to take over their life, forgive them of their sins. That makes the way straight for the power from on high to be funneled through Jesus Christ to bring the Holy Spirit inside so that a change can be made from the inside out. Or for those of us who have been saved and we've taken ad advantage of it, we've kind of taken it for granted. And we're good and we don't tell anybody about it. Lord, forgive us. Over this next seven days, Lord, over this next seven days, may we take the opportunity to share with someone how you've changed our life through salvation. God, do your work right now that only you can do. It's in Jesus' name we pray.